To say that Nintendo is doing very well right now would be an understatement. After the Wii U failed to impress most of the gaming audience, the Nintendo Switch not only was a slight improvement hardware-wise, but it was also a financial success, selling more units than the Wii U in its first year alone. But like all companies, not all their games are perfect. Now, just to clarify, none of these games are as bad as the barely functional Action 52 or Buggy as Hell Big Rigs. They are all programmed well, and I could see why some like these games, but if you were to ask me what games from Nintendo I like the least, these five games rank at the bottom of my list of Nintendo games I played. So with all that said, let's rock it. So, to kick things off is the most recent game I played for this video, and it's from a franchise I love the most. Pokemon Ultra Sun and Moon. While well, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Moon are fine enough games on their own gameplay-wise, I feel that outside of gameplay, every other element of the Ultra games are a major downgrade compared to Sun and Moon, and that makes me question the point of playing it again when I could just play the original games instead. While well, the music is mostly the same as the original versions, which are good tracks for the record, the new tracks they made felt incredibly forgettable or not that great to listen to when I listened to them during my playthrough, and individually. Some themes include Ultra Necrozma, the Recon Squad themes, the Ultra Dringle and Plant track, the new Champion theme, the title screen theme, etc. The new Ultra Beasts weren't that great design-wise when compared to the previous Ultra Beasts, except for maybe Poipole, and even then that's stretching it. I didn't like the Necrozma fusions with the Alolan mascots, and even Zara Aura feels more like an Alolan Zoroark instead of a mythical Pokemon that's hidden behind a download code for later. I also wasn't a fan of the changes to the original story. I didn't like that they watered down Lucimine's character to make Necrozma the main focus slash enemy of the game. I didn't like the Ultra Recon squad and their storyline. I didn't like the Rainbow Rocket post game because the story wasn't all that interesting despite the core members coming from worlds where they took over the world which could have made for an interesting pop but wasn't executed well etc and that bugs me because one of the things i liked about the original alone games was the story so to see an inferior story in a game that is basically the ultimate edition of gen 7 is really disappointing again it's not a terrible game far from it but compared to the original sun and moon it comes off as an inferior product to me. Speaking of disappointing, my next least favorite game is Samus Returns. Like Ultra Sun, Samus Returns is still a good game, and I'm glad it exists since it means we may get more Metro games in the future. But again, I felt this game was a disappointment. And no, this has nothing to do with AM2R. I have my own issues with that game, and I went to Samus Returns with an open mind, so that's not why I'm disappointed with it. So why was I disappointed then? Because the game, to me, has a bunch of issues that I can't ignore. Yes, the level design is better than the original Game Boy game, but the game itself still feels really linear, which for a Metroid game is something I'm not a fan of. I don't know, I know some people prefer this style for Metroid games, especially in Fusion, but I'm just not one of them. I also didn't like the difficulty spikes that numerous points in the game, nor did I like the heavier focus on the counterpunch slash AO mechanics. The counterpunch feels awkward to use at points, as well as it feeling out of place sometimes in the series known for shooting enemies with your arm cannon, and I also felt the Aeon mechanics, safe the Aeon scan, were pretty forgettable in comparison to the other upgrades Samus got in her adventure. Also, Fuck the circle pad controls. In a game that has tight platforming at points, I'd like to be able to control my character without having to rock the circle pad back and forth, which is something I had to do multiple times in the game to make sure I could land the platform safely, for fuck's sake. I didn't even like the music this time around, which is usually an aspect of Metroid that I like. But, like I said in the opening, I'm glad that this game exists, and I did have some fun with Sam's Returns minus the parts that bugged me. It's just that, compared to other Metroid games I've played, this has been my least favorite so far. But eh, maybe the next Metro game will be a lot better. Speaking of disappointments though, again, the next entry on this list is Smash Brothers Brawl. Now, I grew up with the original Smash Brothers in Melee, so to see a game I was anticipated for to be a letdown when I finally sat down and played it, that fucking sucks. Oh sure, the fighting mechanics work fine, and it's nice to see an early attempt at online play, though the execution was, yeah, pretty bad. But I'm not a fan of most of the new characters, the subspace emissary was a good concept, but not executed all that well, I'm not a fan of the assist trophies, and a lot of the new stages were also just okay to me. Same with most of the new items, except for maybe the final smash. That being said, I can understand why people like this game. The game controls pretty well, the movement is nice and smooth for the most part, and the final smash mechanic was a good idea. I just feel that it could have been better looking back on it, and as a result, it's probably my least favorite of the Smash Brothers series. But but for me, it did get better with Smash 4, and I'm still excited for the upcoming game for the Switch, even if it is potentially a port. So, yeah, another disappointment, but it served its purpose for the franchise it was a part of. Alright, the second to last entry comes from another franchise I love, the Zelda series. My least favorite Zelda game is Phantom Hourglass. 
While the original NES Zelda suffers from first game syndrome, the 2007 sequel to The Wind Waker was a game that I really didn't enjoy all that much. Not because of disappointment, but because I genuinely didn't like the game as a whole. I didn't like the controls, largely because unlike Mario 64 DS, which lets you use the D-pad or stylus to control Mario, the only way you could control the character was with the stylus, which I did not like because I had numerous issues with it during my playthrough. I get why it was implemented, but that doesn't mean I have to like its execution, and I don't here. I seriously think they should have used the D-pad as an alternative option. Music was forgettable, I wasn't a fan of the ship mechanics this time around, the dungeons itself were really forgettable or just downright bad. High Temple of the Ocean King. And even the bosses slash story weren't all that appealing or great. Look, I applaud the creators for trying to do something new with the series. That's not my problem. My problem is that I don't think it was executed that well in the grand scheme of things. And no, I have not played Spirit Tracks yet, but from what I've heard about it, my issues with the controls are still present, so I'm probably not going to be picking that up anytime soon. To conclude this list, let's talk about our Fox Command. Like Phantom Hourglass, I do not like the controls since it requires the use of the stylus only, which made it awkward for me when I was in the R-Wing shooting targets. Again, I know why it's there, but the lack of a D-pad as a secondary option still bugs me. I don't like the music, I don't like the bosses or characters, and while the models look good for the time, the change in gameplay has not aged well for me. Unlike past games, Star Fox Command spends most of your time plotting out moves like a strategy game, with battles that may work for something like Fire Emblem, or maybe Civilization, but for a game series based around non-stop action slash dogfighting for most of its installments, this kind of gameplay doesn't do it for me, and given how most of these missions are blow things up, it makes me want to go and play one of the earlier games instead, since those don't have these sections and small intervals of a fucking chapter. Like the controls, I can see why it was implemented this way because the handheld has a battery life and all, but that doesn't mean I have to like its execution, and like so many other entries on this list, I don't. Then again, if it wasn't set up this way, then we couldn't have nine poorly written endings that make the characters look really bad or really fucking stupid. Not like that's too hard to do, because holy shit, this fucking story sucks. If it doesn't paint its characters as complete assholes or idiots, it's so overdramatic that it hurts to watch. God, say what you will about the previous Star Fox games and their stories, but at least it didn't get this soap opera and have a bunch of drama that I couldn't give two shits about because the writing was really fucking bad. And it's such a pity too, because I love the Star Fox series. All I got Star Fox 64 3D and that was a lot of fun. So to see it reach this much of a low point, it's really sad for me. Now, like I said in the beginning, None of these games are as bad or worse than games like Action 52 or Big Rigs, and I can understand why people like these games. For me though, these are 5 Nintendo games that I like the least out of all the Nintendo games I've played thus far. So that concludes this list. I await your comments, and until we meet again, I'm David Grimm, and thanks for watching.